And thank you all for coming. I'm very excited uh, about this evening because uh, this is all new. I realize I've never spoken about Cairo before. So um, I've, I've put together an all new talk. Um, but before I, before I begin, I thought, as I can't sort of magic us all off to Egypt, to Cairo, I thought I'd bring a bit of Cairo here. So if we can have the lights down. Um, we'll start. I did think of running a whole hour of that, but that's pro probably <laughs> enough. Um, oh, wait, that didn't, yes, there we are. Uh, one evening in the spring of 1985, um, I stepped onto a balcony high up um, uh, above, above the Nile. I looked onto a, a view more or less like this. Um, and what struck me more than, more than the beauty of the view, the light, the, you know, the, the glory of it, was the, the pulsing energy. There's a sound when you step out and into the night in Cairo, um, which, which I didn't record there, but I, we could have gone on with it, um, which is a sense of packed humanity going about all sorts of activities. Anything you'd think of is happening down there at this particular moment. Um, and I could hardly sleep with excitement. This, is, this was my first night. I'd just come in from the airport. Um, and the next, the next morning, um, when I woke up, I, this, is, this is what I wrote down, because this is the view that I got. White sails unfurled, feluccas moved across the dark Nile. Traffic on the Corniche roads was still light. It was, it was quite early. And I could pick out individual sounds of people calling to one another, of a car's horn, and then a woman singing. On the horizon to my right, beyond the extensive jumble of roofs and towers on Cairo's west bank, across one half of the Nile Valley, the three main pyramids shimmered, a mirage made perfect by the distance, a hazy continuation of a dreamlike view. To the left, I looked across the heartland of Islamic Cairo. In there was the Mosque of Amr, the general from Mecca and friend of the Prophet Muhammad himself, who founded the city of Fustat, the camp, in 640 AD and the University Mosque of Al-Azhar, which was built by the Fatimid general Goha in 970 and was the beginning of the city of al kahira the victorious Cairo. Now, I've been coming back to that river and to that view ever since. Um, in, in 1988, about three years after my first visit, I fell in love in Cairo, and a year later I got married, more or less on that piece of water just there. Um, and then I lived on a rooftop um, a little bit further down, um, somewhere, somewhere about there. And, um, you know, and, and on, on, our, on the evenings, at the end of the day, we'd sit together on the terrace, look over the river, and one or other of us would say, you'll never believe what, we saw to, what I saw today. One day it would be a policeman waving traffic the wrong way down a one-way street. <laughs> 
Another, it would be a sage, a wise old woman reading palms in a cafe. Another, it would be the baker cycling through traffic with trays of flat bread on his head and no brakes on his bike. And so on and so on. Every day, another wonder. Cairo, a city of surprises and wonders. It's also a city defined by geography, um, as you would have seen from the, from the map. Um, hemmed in by the desert, at the end, end of, the, of the Nile Valley, just where it opens up to the desert. I'm not sure which one. No. Just where it opens up to the desert, on the route, route to the Red Sea, to Africa, to the Near East. It's a bridge, a trading post, a surprising cosmopolitan city. In the 1930s, there was a woman called Mrs. Devonshire who used to take small groups of lucky people traveling around Cairo. She'd have sort of day trips there. And she wrote, to a lover of history and art in general, Cairo is the most interesting city in the world. Surprise then and fascination as well. Florence Nightingale, who visited some 70 years earlier and who's the subject of my new book, um, published tomorrow and on sale here today, <laughs> Put it differently, no one ever talks about the beauty of Cairo. No one ever gives you the least idea of this surpassing city. I thought it was a place to buy stores at and pass through on one's way to India, instead of it being the rose of cities, the garden of the desert, the pearl of Moorish architecture, the fairest, really the fairest place of earth below. And she had, you know, she had at this point, she was very familiar with Rome, with Paris, with European cities. So it wasn't as though this was the first, first place she'd seen when she stepped out of home. Well, people do talk about Cairo, but they don't always talk in such flattering terms now. Um, for many people, Cairo appears as it does to the guy I buy vegetables from uh, down in my market here in London. He took his wife to Cairo on a day trip. Uh, they were on, on holiday in Cyprus. Um, must have been a busy sort of day because they, they, they flew from Cyprus very early in the morning. They saw the pyramids, went to the museum, saw all the Tutankhamun treasures, and then went to the souk. And uh, that's when the problem started. Uh, they stood in the square outside the mosque of Hussein and looked down the crowded alley, something like this, leading into the Khan al-Khalili, the tourist bazaar, and decided to go no further. I thought, he told me, that if I took the missus in there, only one of us was coming out. <laughs> so what can we extract from these, these little glimpses? That Cairo is a city of beauty and surprise, of mystery, danger, exoticism, and perhaps also, above all, of crowds. Now, regarding the crowds, here are some facts. And, and I, there aren't too many facts I'm going to dish you tonight, but you're getting them all right at the beginning. In 1882, the population of Cairo was 400,000. It grew 50% in the next 15 years. It was around a million by the 1930s. In 1956, the year of the Suez Crisis, when the Brits were finally forced out, Cairo's population stood at 3.5 million. And some strange statistician calculated that there would be 4.2 million people by the end of the year 2000. I'm not quite sure where they were working. Anyway, but that figure was reached by 1960. The population of Cairo now uh, nobody knows for sure, but it's around 18 million. London has 8 million. The M25 runs around London for 110 miles. That's about 190 kilometers. The ring road around Cairo is 110 kilometers. So you have a much, much smaller, smaller uh, uh, surface and many, many more people living it. Cairo is intense. It's packed. And life here is intense as well. A city of, uh, of such immense size, the largest in Africa, the largest in the Arab world, one of the largest in the world, is going to be many things to many people and many different things to different people. It's always been that way. People have seen in Cairo what they want to see. Take Major Jarvis, a British officer stationed in the city in the 1930s. He wrote a classic colonialist tongue-in-cheek description of Cairo. He said, it has a population of one million, of which 955,000 are government officials, and the odd 45,000 are servants, taxi drivers, shopkeepers, and sweepers. The city consists of shops and hotels, the Turf Club, the Gazira Club, and about 10,000 government offices. To the north is Abyssia, where, where the soldiers live. 
North again is Heliopolis, where enormously wealthy retired Egyptians have palaces, and the RAF has small flats. And south is Mardi, where some highbrows addicted to gardening dwell. They also write poetry and, and, and read books. There are some pyramids and a sphinx to the west, and duck shoots to the northwest and southwest. East, there is nothing except the citadel, where Saladin used to keep a part of his army. That nothing in the east happens to be the heart of the city and the center of my fascination. This need to have a selective, a selective vision, which Major Jarvis takes to the extreme, this need to break down the mass, has become more pronounced as the city has grown. Um, it's, it's difficult to get hold of 18 million people to try and understand something about them. And that was something that was brought out by the great Kyrene novelist, Naguib Mahfouz, who, um, who, to the great pride of the Egyptian nation, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1988. They made special mention of his Cairo trilogy, um, which is all set in the heartland of the Islamic city. Major Jarvis is nothing. Um, but soon after he won the prize, Mahfouz uh, went public and said, actually, he couldn't write anymore because he didn't have a subject. And he didn't have a subject because he didn't understand these people anymore. They'd moved away from him, their, their aspirations, their desires, their behavior. He no longer understood what they wanted, who they were. And this mismatch between the man and, and, his, and his, the world around him was sadly brought out a few years later when um, is it just, just like Salman Rushdie, there was a fatwa out against uh, Mahfouz. And he came out of his house one day and went into his car. And thinking that, uh, that someone came up to, up to the window of his car, and he thought it was somebody wanting his autograph. But unfortunately, it was somebody who stuck a knife in his neck. Um, he survived happily, but uh, he never really got over that, that shock of misunderstanding what had happened in his city. And part of, it, part of this problem, as I said, is that the city is so diverse. There's so much going on, and it's so fast moving that it's difficult to get hold of it. Um, around that time, it was, it was also really difficult to get, to get across the city, to move physically in it. Um, it. It did, for a little while, get easier. I think it's got harder again. Um, so if you took a taxi across the city, you would invariably get caught in a conversation, because you're all going to be in there for a long time. And so Cairo taxi drivers are a great source of, of entertainment and, and information. And invariably, in, if you're there on a hot day, what you're going to get is a story about his woes. So there's the rising price of bread. There's the rising price of, of fuel. There's the problems with his car. There's the difficulties with his wife, the crying children, the holes in the road, the fact that nobody ever pays him properly, and on and on and on. And I tried to soothe this guy one day and said, um, never mind, I said to him, that using the Kyrene mantra, Cairo is umedunya, mother of the world. And yes, snapped the taxi driver. And that's the problem. If she was the father of the world, we wouldn't have had this problem. <laughs> so this mother has many, many offspring. There are many layers. Um, one, one, of the, one of the things that 19th century visitors like to do was talk about Egypt as a palimpsest, where you get one layer built on top of another. And, and Cairo is, is like Egypt in that. But, um, we can't look at all the layers tonight, I mean, unless you're, unless you're, you're here for the long run, because uh, there are so many of them. So I'm just going to be talking about a couple. I'm not, for instance, going to be talking about uh, this, which is, I'm not talking about the pyramids, and I'm not talking about the early, early Cairo, because um, in a way, this, this is not Cairo proper. This beautiful mosque, which is uh, built by uh, Ahmed ibn Tulun in 870, AD is one of the wonders of, of, uh, of Cairo, one of the wonders of Egypt, one of the, one of the finest Islamic buildings in the world. Um, but it was built by, um, by a Kurd who, uh, who had just invaded the country. And his, the city, the, the camp he had built, um, which has now become part of Cairo, was not, it was not Cairo, it was, an, it was something else, it was called El Talai. And the same with the Roman, with the Byzantine, with the earlier settlements as well. So we're moving on to something else. We're moving on to the city that, that the Arabian Nights called the mother of the world. Um, the city's real name is uh, Misr. And this, word, this, this is the Arabic name for the country that we call Egypt, um, in the same way that Tunis is the capital of Tunisia, and Algiers is the capital of Algeria. Misr is the capital of Misr. 
Um, but it also has another name, al Cahira, the victorious, which is where we get Cairo from. Cairo was not founded by Egyptians. It was founded by Fatimids, Shiites from Tunis, um, who uh, chased out the, uh, Ahmed ibn Tulun and his, and his followers, his, his um, descendants. And they brought the bones of their ancestors to this, city, to this place. And they decided they weren't going to, uh, to build around the old settlements. They were going to build an entirely new one in a new place. And they laid out this, this fine palace city. Um, this is the main street that ran through the Fatimid city. This is the main street that runs through Islamic Cairo today. And the recording I played you at the beginning was one I made a couple of months ago walking along there. Um, but it did take an hour and a half or whatever to walk through, so you got the highlight. Um, this city was intended to be separate from, from everywhere else. The, the Christians were still living down by the Christian Roman enclave. Um, the Sunni Muslims were living around Ahmed ibn Tulun's um, camp and also at Fustat, an earlier settlement. This was a forbidden city in the way, in the way that uh, Beijing was later to have a forbidden city. It was for the palace, for the court, and for the army. And it consisted of this great palace, which was one of the, one of the wonders of the age. Um, the Fatimid caliph who, who created this city, his name is al muiz and he is honored by having this street named after him. Um, and he, had, he was a man with ambitions, um, almost as great as Ale Alexander. He wanted his new city to rule the world. Um, and there are plenty of stories around the founding of the city. Um, the opening lines of, of Tristram Shandy, the 18th century novel, come to mind. I wish my mother and father had thought what they were about when they begot me, because uh, they, they made great effort when they founded this city, and they laid out these walls. Um, to break the ground at the most auspicious moment. Astrologers were, were, um, were, were brought in. They watched the stars. They watched the movement of the moon. Um, they, you know, they, they, they read the waters. And a string had been laid the whole way around this enclave. Um, and ropes spread across it and bells laid on it. And at the precise moment when the stars were in perfect alignment for the fortune of this, of this new city, um, the, the bells would be rung, but unfortunately uh, a crow settled on the, on the rope and the bell rang early. And so instead of it being the city of fortune, it became El Cahira, Mars, the, the, uh, the victorious, was in ascendant at that particular moment, and so it became the victorious city. Um, it did, however, fulfill, almost, almost as it fulfilled uh, al muizs ambition, it did become the great world city. Um, the original forbidden city, this is one of its gates, um, saw brilliance and violence. Um, the Fatimid caliphs were tolerant of other sects and religions. They were quite happy for the Sunnis to live in, in their own area. They promoted trade, and they taxed heavily, and they grew very rich. And they surrounded their beautiful city with this fabulous wall. Um, this was a bit that was only uncovered quite recently. Um, so, and there's a description of entering the Great Palace from 1167, written by William Bishop of Tyre, who accompanied some crusaders who had uh, been granted an audience with the caliph. And you can get, William, William uh, prefaced his description by saying, um, I, I'm afraid to write this down for you because nobody is going to believe just how splendid this place is. They were led, he wrote, by mysterious corridors and through guarded doors where stalwart Sudanis saluted them with naked swords. They reached a spacious court open to the sky and surrounded by arcades resting on marble pillars. The paneled ceilings were carved and inlaid with, in gold and colors. The pavement was rich mosaic. The unaccustomed eyes of the rude knights opened wide with wonder at the taste and refinement that met them at every step. At last, after many turns and windings, they reached the throne room with a sudden rapid sweep. The heavy curtains broidered with gold and pearls were drawn aside and on a golden throne, robed in more than regal state, the caliph sat. At this point, they were terrified. They'd, they'd been forced to kiss the ground when they came through the first gate. They'd been put through all this sort of thing. 
they were, they were, they were overawed by the time they, um, they, they saw the caliph. And Cairo has always loved this sort of pomp and ceremony. Um, but there, there's also been um, dramas attached to the, the Fatimids, which, uh, which Cairo, Cairo did not like. One of the last was uh, the man who built uh, this tower. This, this is his mosque, uh, Al-Hakim, who uh, was deranged in a very serious way. Um, his reign starts with him eviscerating, I think, one of his, uh, one of his young, young attendants and goes on through a sort of Shakespearean bloodbath. Um, he, he also wasn't very keen on, on women, so he banned the, the, um, the, the manufacture of women's shoes in, in the hope that they would stay inside. But he did, do, he did do one thing which shows the nature, the nature of Cairo, and, and that is that it was a, a meeting place, still a, a bridge. He, he made sure that nobody cheated in the market. Um, and he did this by popping up every now and again with, um, with his attendants and having the scales in the market checked. And there's one, one story um, that, that survives of a trader being found to be using false weights who was uh, publicly sodomized by the, by the caliph's uh, slave. All this, of course, is great for the exoticism, but not so good for the, um, the image of Cairo, I suppose. Anyway, the, uh, the Kyrians got fed up with, with, uh, with, with this man, with El Hakim, and one day he goes, one night, because he liked to ride at night, he goes out on, for a ride and he doesn't come back. His body was never found. Nobody knew what happened. There are some people who think he metamorphed into um, the leader of the Druze in Lebanon, but uh, there's no proof to that. Um, the Fatimid city didn't last, of course. Nothing ever does, especially in Egypt. You learn that things pass. Everything passes. This fabulous piece of, piece of architecture, not, not the bit on top, but this bit, was built by Saladin, um, who took, took over a Kurd again um, in the pay of a Syrian who conquered, conquered Egypt and deposed the, the um, Shiite Fatimids and created his own Sunni dynasty um, and built this citadel. And he moved the palace up there, up onto the, up onto the hill. He's wise. It's the high point. Supposedly, he built it with uh, crusader, crusader captives. Um, but there's, I'm not sure there's any actual written record of that. And that remained the seat of power for the next 700 years. Um, the for Forbidden City was opened up. People moved in. Uh, palaces turned into mansions, parade grounds to souks. But not everything disappeared. Oh, there we are. That main street I was talking about, the main street we heard about, the main street I pointed out on the map, um, this is one of its focals, focal points. Um, and it's part of the original Fatimid city. And it is the, the mosque of Al-Azhar, which is the, um, the, a very, uh, very, very, very potent symbol in Islam. It is the cent cent one of the centers of uh, theology for Islam. It is the, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar is one of the most respected of all people in the Muslim world. Um, and this supposedly may also be the first university in the world, because um, it was set up from the very beginning to be a teaching place. Um, here's another mosque, the mosque of, uh, of al Akmar, which is, I was walking past on a Friday morning. It's still in use, a thousand years later. Um, people just wandering, wandering, wandering in and out. It was here along this street, more than anywhere else in, in Cairo, that I understood the importance of the city. Because here, in its medieval heart, you can see it's not just the largest city of an African state, and not just the, it's more than the sum of its parts. It is, a, it is somehow a sort of a beacon. It's a super capital. It's, um, it speaks to us who, who pass through from, from Europe of exoticism, crowds, romance, and danger. But it speaks to its own people and many, many, many millions elsewhere as the embodiment of an idea, because this was the first Arab mega city. It's the first large scale hub around which all Islam revolves. Baghdad has its memorials. Damascus has its Umayyad mosque. But nowhere has this, the, range of, the range of architecture that Cairo has. You can imagine the world passing along a, along the, a street like this. This is uh, Al-Mu'iz Street again, near one of the other gates. Um, 
You can imagine how, how much this, this city flourished because it, it, it survived on trade. It flourished on trade. They weren't making things there. They were s selling them. It was coming up the Nile. It was coming across Africa. Huge caravans of inevitably camels. Um, it was being brought up the, up the river, as up and down the river. Um, this is the medieval Cairo heading towards its apogee. In, in 1326, the great Arab traveler Ibn Battuta, who's just on, starting out on his 29-year journey from Tangier. We travel writers think we have it tough these days. This is what he wrote. At length, I arrived at the city of Mizr, mother of cities and seat of Pharaoh the tyrant, mistress of broad provinces and fruitful lands, boundless in multitude of buildings, peerless in beauty and splendor, the meeting place of comer and goer, the stopping place of feeble and strong. She surges as the waves of the sea with her throngs of folk and can scarce contain them for all the capacity of her situation and sustaining power. Her youth is ever new in spite of length of days and the star of her horoscope does not move from the mansion of fortune. Her conquering capital has subdued the nations and her kings have grasped the forelocks of both Arab and non-Arab. It's said that in Cairo there are 12,000 water carriers who transport water on donkeys, that on its Nile there are 36,000 vessels belonging to the Sultan and his subjects which sail upstream to Upper Egypt and downstream to Alexandria and Damietta, are laden with goods and commodities of all kinds. The people of Cairo are fond of pleasure and amusement. So here's the beginning of a pattern of behavior. Um, there's this sense of of, of uh, I mentioned at the beginning, of a sort of pulse, pulsating life. Um, and you can feel it there in Ibn Battuta's description. Um, also of royal enclaves being turned over to the people, privileged space being overwhelmed by a growing population, and of trade. And also the cosmopolitan nature of the city. Cairo was one of, and maybe even the biggest city in the world at that time. Um, Saladin's people move on, his dynasty falls. And, um, and it's replaced by a slave, a slave group called Mamluks, who are, um, who are slaves bought. They're not, again, they're not Egyptians. They're bought from, um, from Circassia, from what's now Turkey, from Central, Central Europe, and from uh, Central Asia as well. They're Mongols, they're Tatars, and all sorts of people are brought in as slaves. And the more promising slaves are promoted and end up, um, some of them, being appointed, being appointed sultan. And the idea behind it was that you then, you wouldn't have this problem of, of dynasty, of, you wouldn't have a problem of, um, of loyalty. You would know that you could trust the people around you because you bought them, you trained them, they owed everything to you. And uh, well, it survived for 300 years or so as an idea. It, um, it wasn't necessarily successful because you did have dynasties and you did have an awful lot of murder and uh, you know, with, with sultans being clubbed to, clubbed to death or poisoned or garroted or whatever. But um, it also produced fabulous architecture. It was very good for the city. Um, this, is on, uh, this building is on um, that central street on, between the pal what, were, what were the palaces. And um, it's a tomb of one of the Mamluk sultans. And you can see just the splendor of it, because one of, one of the problems of being a sultan at that, po that time, a Mamluk sultan, is you weren't allowed to pass your wealth on to your children when you died. So what you, what you ended up doing was spending as much of it as you could while you were alive. And they built these magnificent tomb mosques, um, which is quite unusual at the time. You didn't normally get buried inside your tomb. People were normally buried outside the city, but um, this dome is, is the tomb part of it, and obviously this is the minaret, and then the bulk of it is, is a mosque. And the, the street has a line of them. This one, which is right next door to the other one, belongs to the man who, um, you might notice something familiar about the entrance here. It, it, it's part of a, um, of a crusader church, and he's the man who th threw the uh, crusaders out of Acre in, in uh, Palestine. And to his glory, he brought back that. Um, there also, these buildings are sumptuous inside as well as out. Um, you might notice on the right-hand side of the picture that mosques are used for many things in Cairo, including a moment of peace and quiet 
Florence Nightingale t- said how, how happy she was to see that people used mosques for sleeping, for chatting, for all, all sorts of things. Um, she, was, she, was, yeah, she was very impressed by that. She said, if only, if only we could use churches in the same way. Um, and so the idea behind this is that you would, you would be remembered because you would build this magnificent building. People would come and pray. And very often you would build a, a school or a souk or something around it that would attract people to remember you, in, in very much in the way that actually the ancient Egyptian pharaohs planned theirs as well. The Mamluk moment ended in 1517 when the, uh, when the Ottoman Turks arrived and the last Mamluk sultan was hung from um, just beneath this tower, actually. Uh, they strung him up and uh, threw, him, threw him off the edge and the rope snapped. So poor man, they tried again, they strung him up a second time and then he died. And that was the end, that was the end or at least of Mamluk ascendancy for the, from 1517 until the end of the First World War. Cairo, Egypt, is a province of the Ottoman Empire. Um, but it's, in a way, it sort of fades to black. It's not that nothing, nothing interesting happens in that period, but I'm not terribly interested in it because the power doesn't lie in Cairo. Cairo is ruled by governors, by, by the Ottomans. It's, it belongs to the Ottoman Sultan in Constantinople in Turkey. So um, I think the, the next really fascinating moment in, in Egyptian history is this moment, the end of the, ni- end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century. Um, this is a, a view taken, uh, a drawing done by the British uh, ambassador to consul to, uh, to Cairo at the time, Henry Salt, I think in the 1810s. Um, but in 17, 9, 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte arrives in Cairo um, with, and tells the Egyptians that he's come to liberate them. He's come to revive the glory of the ancients. Um, they being wise and also haven't been ruled by foreigners at this point um, ever since, well, do you, do you count Cleopatra as an Egyptian? They were, they were Greco, they, they were Ptolemy, Ptolemies, they were not Egyptian natives. So Egypt, Cairo hadn't been ruled by Kyrians at all up until this point. So um, they, they knew that he hadn't come for the glory of Egypt, they, that he'd come for some political purpose, in particular because Cairo had become the, one of the key points on the overland route to India, and the British Empire was growing fast, and Napoleon thought he could get to the British this way. So um, it was more of the same. But uh, Napoleon's only, only there for a few years because uh, while he, he's having great fun chasing the Mamluks, he has a famous battle of, which he says calls the Battle of the Pyramids, but it's actually a little bit further north. Um, and then his, then his army chases the Mamluks right down to Aswan. If you, um, if you go to, to the Temple of Philae, you can see a beautiful inscription carved in the, in the entrance of the, of the ancient temple, which records the passing of the French troops chasing the Mamluks to the south. Um, but while that's going on, the British fleet has caught up with the French fleet up on the north coast, and Nelson, soon to become Lord Nelson of the Nile, um, sinks the French fleet and effectively ends the, the, the Napoleon's uh, project in Egypt. Napoleon slips, out, slips back to France without even telling his generals that he's going um, and leaves his army to surrender. But he leaves lots of things behind. The, the, you know, he's a, he was a man of immense energy and his, his legacy is, um, lives on today. He Revive, well, first of all, he, he gave Egypt its, um, its law. Um, you know, the, the Code Napoleon is still, still observed there. He gave it a sense of culture and interest in what culture could be. He created the, uh, the, the National Institute. He, and I think above all, he revived um, an interest in, um, in, the, in Europe, um, in ancient Egypt, and particularly through, because he arrived not just with an army of soldiers, but also with an army of scholars. And they, um, they produced this thing called the Description de l'Egypte, which is the first attempt to, to say what this country is. So they, they, they observe and, and describe and draw most of the temples and tomb, uh, most of the, the archaeology along the river, but also everything that grows, everything that flies, everything that moves. It's an extraordinary work. Um, I don't think the British did quite so much, unfortunately. Um, this this moment when, when the French leave and the, um, creates a power vacuum. The Ottoman 
uh, the Sultan in Istanbul, in Constantinople, had sent um, a force under an Albanian officer called Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali, having chased the French and then the British out of Egypt, decides actually that rather than rule the country for the Ottoman Sultan, he would rather rule it for himself. And he starts another dynasty of, of foreigners, um, which, uh, well, Again, I mean, uh, the, is, was the Egyptian royal family Egyptian? Um, the guide who took us around in Egypt a few months ago was talking about the our Albanian kings, and he was talking about King Farouk, who, was, uh, who, who ruled until 1952. Um, the most no noteworthy of this generation, of this uh, dynasty, rather, was a man called Ismail Pasha. Who, um, who lived to see the opening of the Suez Canal, um, he said, henceforth, this is, a, this is part of his speech at the opening of the Suez Canal, 1869, henceforth, Egypt is part of Europe, not of Africa. Um, and they turned out to be very pr prophetic words because um, it didn't quite work out the way he intended because he thought he was allying himself in some way with, with Europeans. And we would be t he would be taken seriously in the way of a, a European um, country would expect to be taken seriously. It's part of his development of, um, of the city. Uh, Ismail Pasha moved himself and, uh, and an awful lot of people out of the old city and, and filled in this land, actually, this, a lot of this land, which in the, even in, when Florence Nightingale was there, there was the port of Bulak, where you arrived by boat, was down on the river. But between there and the city, there was farmland. And Ismail Pasha, gives it, more or less, or, uh, yes, or sells it very, very cheaply to, for development, and, and modern downtown Cairo is built. Um, unfortunately, in, in, borrowing, um, in borrowing money for this, he borrows from European banks, and um, he is very quickly bankrupted. And, okay, after that, e Egypt is part of Europe because the British uh, buy the Suez Canal for a million pounds, take over running of the Egyptian administration, invade in 1882, and are there until, well, well into the 20th century. So yes, uh, we, we never made it an official colony. It becomes a protectorate after the First World War, um, but we effectively rule it, the British rule it, um, from, from the 1880s. So it is part of, part of Europe. And it's part of Europe because, because it's so important in our access to India. Um, it's not that we're particularly in love with Egypt. Lots of Brits were, but that's not, that wasn't the politics behind it. Um, and then, uh, wonderfully, finally, this, this is, these are images of um, some of downtown Cairo. There's really ornate and fabulous buildings. There's lots of them. And this is um, one of the last, well, th yeah, this is part of a palace, the Manyal Palace. Um, which, is, uh, which has survived. 1950, 1951, there is a revolution, and the royal family are thrown out, and um, their palaces are turned into museums. This building here is the Cairo Tower, a monument to independent Egypt, finally, 1952, ruled by Egyptians. Gamal Abdel Nasser, and, uh, and the city becomes the city that we, that we can now visit. It's the city of all, all this massive spread here. Um, it's, it's the city that excited me as well. It's spread from up here. This is, this is the old city. And this is where Al-Azhar, the mosque is. This is the road through the, through the middle. And it's spread down to all of this. And then this was the, uh, the sporting club that Major Jarvis was talking about, but he had omitted to mention any of that bit because it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't somewhere where an Englishman would go. As well as G Gamal Abdel Nasser, there is this, this woman, the icon of Egypt, Umm Kalsum, the star of the East, she's called. And she rises with, with the revolution. She has a fabulous voice. She sings like n nobody else on earth. Um, and she managed to, to, to become the spirit of an, a new Egypt, even though she's here photographed with old Egypt behind her. And um, 
She sings of love, and she sings ambiguously. She sings of love that could be for a man or a woman, but could also be for God. And that allows her. She's part of a social revolution that happens in the wake of this, in the wake of this revolution. She used to sing a new song on a Thursday night each month, and it was broadcast on, on radio. And when they were broadcast, more or less, the country more or less came to a standstill. Um, and some of her, you know, one song you could have going on for an hour or so. Um, she, uh, she captivated the country. Her funeral in 1975 was described by uh, my friend Maria Golia in her, her wonderful book, Cairo, City of Sands, as the greatest commonly enacted, enacted epic in the history of Cairo. More than two million people turn out in, into the main square, into Tahrir Square, and effectively hijack her body and take it up into the old city. That wasn't where they were planning on, planning on going. But this mass of people take the body, take the coffin, and, and carry it on their shoulders. They have, the, the officials eventually um, rescue it, and it's buried in its tomb in the, in the City of the Dead. Um Kalsum's funeral, sort of rather like John Lennon's, heralds the end of an era. It's the end of a, it's, I think in a way, it's the end of, it's the, end of the Cairo that someone like Nagib Mahfouz knew and, and, and understood. 1970s, you have this huge population explosion. You have the, 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 um, the disastrous wars with, with Israel, and the, not just the, uh, the, the cost and morale, but also in, in money and, and in international relations. Um, and, then, and then you have e Egypt makes peace with Israel, which brings all sorts of problems with its, with its Arab neighbors. Um, um Kalsum is a constant, though. There isn't a day when you can go walking in Cairo that you won't hear her singing. There's an Um Kalsum cafe, there's an Um Kalsum hotel. You can go to her tomb in the City of the Dead. It's open to visitors. There's a, there's a couple of uh, sofas. The actual burial is just a sort of, um, it, is under the ground. Um, and near the sofas there are power plugs and people take their own, um, in, when I went, it was before the iPod days. So they went with, with tape players and they would play, sit there and play her music and sort of have a party in her tomb. She speaks to, she speaks to Egyptians like nobody else has managed to do. Um, and so we come to the city that, uh, that, that I know, this city of crowds, of condensed city, an intense city, and a city of surprises. Um, it's taken a long time for me to get, to get there because there's so much history involved, and, and, and that's without all the pharaohs and all that other stuff. Um, I, I said at the beginning that Cairo is, is, bound, is defined by its geography, but it's also defined, obviously, by its history, and there's no getting away from it. Even if you live in this window here, you are going to be aware of, of this history. It's constantly breathing down you. Um, when I, when I f first went to Egypt, I um, care of a farmer in, in Middle Egypt, halfway up the Nile. Um, I caught a, a bout of amoebic dysentery. And when I got back to Cairo, I went to the Anglo-American hospital and, uh, and was treated by a man called Halim Grace, who was who was the head of the hospital. And he, he knew that I was a writer and that I was researching social history of Egypt. So he invited me home. Um, and what struck me, because his home was a, you know, it was a modern apartment, um, he, he had done very well, it was a very, very nicely fitted out. But his prized possession, the thing he had in the middle of his home, which in a, and which in a way defined him, was a piece of antiquity. Um, it was, this was his heirloom. I mean, if he, was going to, if he was going to run with anything from his home, if it was burning down, he would have picked that up. Um, it wasn't just the value of it, it was the meaning of it. It connected him to, to the past. Um, a couple of weeks ago, somebody asked me whether I wasn't bored of always going to the same place. Um, God, not back to Egypt again, because I'm off again next week. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that I would go as far as to say what Samuel Johnson said about... Um, about London, that if you're tired of Cairo, then you're tired of life. Because Cairo is a very tiring place, and it's, it is good to leave sometimes. And there's an awful lot of people who would like to be able to leave more often. But it's really good to return. It's a great place to go back to. Um, and what I, what I answered to that point was that I'm ever, I'm just, how could you not be fascinated by something like this, which has all that history behind it, and, and that density of today in front of it? 
Um, this, the, the life, but the life that's lived here is not the same as the life that was lived when Halim Grace was alive, or when I saw him 25 years ago. Um, and space has become a huge issue. You know, where, wherever, you, however you, however wealthy you are, unless you're going to move right out of the city and have a sort of 25-mile commute every day, you, you know, you're going to be living surrounded by other people. Um, even the even the fanciest of houses in places like Zamalek or Mahdi. You can, you can hear the neighbors, you can see the neighbors. There, are no, there, aren't, there is no exclusivity. Um, but in a way, this suits, this suits Koreans. And I don't know whether it's just that they've, people have got used to this, it, but it, it's become part of their makeup. That actually, I've discovered Koreans don't like being on their own. Um, they, they get a sense of reassurance from a crowd, a sense of reassurance of, um, This is, a, this is a rare thing. But I think things have become so intense now um, that the chance of stepping out into a place like this, you know, a couple going for a walk, nobody else bashing up around them, is, is, is increasingly attractive. This is a remarkable project uh, funded by the Aga Khan on what was a rubbish tip um, out just outside the old, old wall. This was. People had been throwing rubbish out, out over that wall for so long that the whole wall had been covered up. Um, and on the mound, they put greenery, and um, there was a water tank on the top, so they've used it for this water feature. So you've got, suddenly got this green space in a city that has very, very few green spaces. And when they first opened it, it, um, it was open to everybody. It was completely overwhelmed. Um, so now you have to pay to get in, which is why it's looking a bit thin on the ground. It's very difficult to get to, to see the Nile, or increasingly difficult to get to see the Nile in central Cairo as well. Um, the, you know, a lot of the banks are now covered with casinos, or sort of with, um, with cafes, or clubs, or something else. So increasingly, people tend to hang out on bridges. Um, if you go there on a summer night, you'll find people on newlyweds will, have, will be having their, their wedding photos taken on a bridge. You'll have families who would have laid out a whole picnic on the, on the, on the pavement. Um, but this, this was still relatively early in the morning, and um, so here's a, a young couple come to consider, consider their life. And I, I just thought, what are they talking about? And I stood and watched them for a while. They were completely engrossed. I mean, what, what are they plotting? What sort of future are they imagining for themselves? What hope? Um, all the problems are spelled out in the, in the stories of, of Nagib Mahfouz's successors, people like uh, Ala, Ala, Ala Swani, who wrote the uh, Yakubian building, which has been a big success here, and um, Khaled Al Khamisi, who wrote a, a book called Taxi, which is a whole series of ima part imagined but obviously part real stories with Cairo taxi drivers. And these are, these are sort of fragments of stories. Um, the Yakubian building is a whole, is the stories of coming out of lots and lots of different rooms and apartments in this big apartment building. Um, and all these people experience the same, the same issues. Um, you know, there's a problem of employment. If you have a job, how do you hold on to it? What do you have to do in order to hold on to it? Um, if you have a job, will it give you enough to, to pay your rent and pay food? No, it won't. So you're doing double jobs, because um, food is very expensive. Um, the person who owns your apartment is probably trying to push you out. Um, you know, the, and then there's corrupt officials, there's whatever. It's, it's in, life has become incredibly difficult for an awful lot of people living in the city. And, and in times of crises, um, I think people tend to do two things. They tend to uh, lean more on religion, put their trust in God, in Allah. And they think about pleasure, and Kyrians are no exception. You don't have to go very far in Cairo to, fi to find you're touching up against a religious moment. Here is one. Um, this white dome here is a saint. And this is, we saw the, the outside of this gate uh, just before. This is the outside, the, the gate of the Fatimid city. Um, it's, a, it's a holy man. I, I asked five people who walked past, who is it? Who's, who's, who's buried in there? And everybody said, oh, I don't know. He's just a sheikh. But everybody sort of mutters something, or I mean, everybody recognizes him. And the city is packed full of shrines of holy men. Um, this is not, this is not uh, Islam. This is, uh, at least not according to the Sheikh of Al-Azhar. 
because I went to ask him about it, and he said, no, no, all this, there's not supposed to be any saints in Islam. That was part of, the, part of the reason that Islam was this message of clearing away saints and priests and anybody who'd stand between you and God. I said, so well, what are these? And, and you know, the, 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 in a way, the patron saint of Cairo, the, um, Hussein, who's the grandson of, of the Prophet Muhammad, whose head is supposedly buried in the city, you know, for his mulid, for his annual celebration, you get one or two million people turning up. Um, you know, if, if this isn't Islam, then what is it? It's some sort of, it's some common need for, um, to, you know, for help, in a way. And there's all sorts of other ways in which rel religion or spiritual matters find their way to the surface in Cairo. This is a picture of a, of a czar, um, which is effectively a sort of an, an exorcism, a, a ridding people of a, of a bad spirit. And it, it's not very Egyptian in its origins. It's, um, I think it's more Sudani, more, more black African. But, um, but it certainly has always been performed, well, at least um, as long as records go back, so let's say the last 150 years in Cairo. And it fits in with a, with a an ancient Egyptian belief, which still survives, not so much in Cairo, but elsewhere in, in Egypt today, of the idea that you have a double. Um, in ancient Egyptians saw your double as a bird that would flew, flew around separately from yourself. And certainly in the, in the early 20th century, anthropologists recording Egyptians as talking about their doubles, um, literally as almost an, an, an invisible avatar who if you had a headache, it wasn't necessarily your headache. It might be the headache of your double. And you had to address, address that. You had to make sure. It was a sense of, of, of what I suppose we would understand as some sort of spiritual awareness, that there's more to you than just your body. Um, that's part of it. Cairo has also been always attracted Sufis. Um, and this uh, snake. Eater, charmer, is a more commercial version of it. Sufis, people who, um, who wish to get closer, uh, closer to God and have a more, more of an understanding of what divinity might mean by performing certain acts. Um, there's a mosque just below the citadel in Cairo called the Mosque of Rifai. And Rifai is the, was before he died, was the sheikh of the snake charmers. And at the mulid every year of the Sheikh Rifa, Rifai, the uh, Rifaya, the people who follow him, the snake charmers come. You see all these fantastic people coming from the countryside um, with snakes. And they perform all sorts of things. There are other people who stick knives through their cheeks in some sort of trance and somehow miraculously don't bleed. I, I did, did see that performed. And I still don't understand how it's done. But anyway, um, I'm a cynic. How could Cairo be anything other than hallowed when, as Ibn Battuta pointed out, some believe that Mukattam, the hill that the citadel sits on and the hill behind the citadel, will, in the, in the day of reckoning, become one of the gardens of paradise. These people, wrote Ibn Battuta, build in the Karafa, which is the cemetery, which is where we are now, beautiful domed chapels and surround them by walls so that they look like houses and they construct chambers in them and hire the services of Quran readers who recite night and day in beautiful voices. They're still doing it. But the houses have been overwhelmed. Well, firstly, the whole cemetery has been overwhelmed by modern buildings. I'm sorry, it's come out rather dark on that screen. Um, but these houses are also lived in by modern Egyptians. Um, this is something of a taboo subject. Uh, I've tried for a long, long time to make a television documentary about the City of the Dead, because I think it's a fascinating mirror to the big city. Um, but I was always refused permission. But this tomb is different, because, and I'm just going to have a little sidetrack for about two minutes, because it belongs to um, one of my heroes. And I've never given a talk on this platform before without mentioning him, Jean-Louis Burkhardt. Um, he's just a little red herring, I'm sorry. He, uh, he's one of the great, great European travelers uh, and much, 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 much um, underestimated. Uh, all, of the, all of the great tra uh, travelers in the Arab world uh, you, you might think of, whether it's uh, Richard Burton going on, on his trip to Mecca or Edward Lane, or all of them start 
They started with, it started with Burkhardt. He did it all before them. They all read everything he wrote before they went off and did, did their journeys. He wasn't even supposed to be in Cairo. He was supposed to be looking for Timbuktu for Joseph Banks, but um, he got held up for many, many years. The, the problem was that he, um, the only way to get to Timbuktu from Cairo was to go with a trade caravan, again, the city of trade. And the only way to go with the trade caravan was to be a Muslim. So over the many, many years, uh, six, seven, eight, I think, he perfects his disguise. And this is how he is just before the caravan is ready to leave Cairo. And then he dies. And this is his tomb. So, um, and it's rather different to other tombs because it actually has a European roof on it, pointy roof. Um, and when I, when I, when I first, first went there, it was officially lost, his tomb. Um, I read in a blue guide that, uh, that, it hadn't, that it somehow it had disappeared. I mean, lots of tombs have disappeared. Um, but Sylvia and I went, went looking for it one day, and we asked, we started asking, because cemeteries have guardians, we started asking, there's a Swiss man who was buried here, and it's like, someone said, oh yes, I think if you go and ask over that bit, you might find. And we, all day we got passed from one person to another, until finally we came across somebody who said, oh yes, a Lausanne, the man from Lausanne, he, um, he's in my patch, so he took us. It was only later I realized that others had been there before me, but anyway. <clears throat> city, of, city of religion, but also city of pleasure. This is a downtown Cairo bar. Um, this is where people drink uh, beer and this stuff, zibib, um, which is like an arak or an ouzo and is really not good for you. Um, in fact, he wouldn't, even, he wouldn't sell any to me. He said, no, no, it's not for you. <laughs> <clears throat> what do people talk about? in a place like this. They're talking about the same as the taxi drivers, they're talking about the same as the young lovers, they're talking about the stress of living in the city. But also, eventually, maybe it takes a few drinks, maybe, um, maybe it doesn't take a few drinks, they're going to start talking about the joy of living in this city, about the excitement of living in the city, about a bit of history. You don't have to scratch a Kyrene very far before you get that. The image of the um, Arabian Nights city, of the home of Umm Kalsum, the singer of love, of Fifi Abdu, the great belly dancer of the Middle East. Um, we, we tend to think of Cairo as oozing sex and sexual, sensuality. Um, although, of course, paradoxically, for most young, young Egyptians, there's very little chance of getting any action at all. But it's changing. And this is something that Mahfouz wouldn't have understood either. This is a, a Cairo club. Um, there are lots of them like this. Uh, this is, you know, this is for well-heeled young Kyrenes and foreigners. Um, and it's pretty much as you would recognize from anywhere else in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a modern bar. People do what they do. Um, Ibn Battuta talked about how Kyrenes were fond of pleasure and amusement. And the center of, of, of this for a long time was a place called Esbekea, which, uh, which was where Europeans in, in the 1810s to 1850s used to wash up and, and where the first hotels were built for, for foreigners. Um, that's where Florence Nightingale and Gustave Flaubert ended up when they first arrived in Cairo and, and where Flaubert had his first sexual experience in Egypt in a brothel just behind the hotel. And it's, a, it's something that sort of carries on through, through, uh, through, the, through the decades. British and Allied soldiers, First World War, Second World War, are going to Esbekea. And then it starts spreading until I, came, I couldn't help putting this picture in. because I, I bought a book in a, from a second-hand book dealer in Cairo a few years ago. And out popped this picture of a dinner in, in 1954, and I thought, I sort of had, had, had the impression that after the revolution, this is two years after the revolution, things would have been different. But it looks, you know, it looks like they're still having a really good time. Um, and, well, he's not, but she is. <laughs> <laughs> so Cairo, city of surprise and frustration. It's also a city of immense satisfaction. And um, as my friend Faiza Hassan, put it so brilliantly. Um, she was a, she was a, a journalist 
a long, long-standing journalist who I met many years ago in Cairo and who unfortunately died quite recently. But uh, a couple of years ago, I did a little interview with her in, in Cafe Groppi, um, downtown Cairo, and this is what she said. It is, and it just somehow sums up that sense of, yeah, it's difficult, but hey. Nine o'clock is really an ungodly hour to be in Cairo. Espresso, fi cappuccino, fi ahwa turki. Well, espresso. I think these are the best years of my life. When I turned 60, I began to enjoy myself. I mean, my husband died, my two daughters are gone, and now I can do exactly what I want. I enjoy being an old lady immensely. I mean, this is real freedom. I go out in the morning and I look at the street that is not well swept and I think, oh wonderful, how human. If I want to throw my cigarette out of the car window, I can do that. I don't care about Cairo being a little bit filthy, so what? It tells you that real people are living here. I love that. Real people. Bless her. Real people. You see them staggering out um, early morning. Just at that moment, and it's a very brief moment, that the city, city is quiet, sort of between the end of the night and the beginning of the day. There's just a moment when Cairo goes still and quiet. You, you see them at the call to prayer. Get out of bed, says the muezzin. Prayer, prayer is better than sleep. You see them running for the buses in the morning, millions heading into the city every day. You see them... Watching, the, watching this guy, the bread guy, no brakes on his bike, remember, riding through the traffic. He can't stop. When he stops, someone is, has to be there to, to take the tray off his head. Um, and somehow he weaves his way, I watched him for ages, he weaves his way through, uh, through, through the traffic. He, it's not by chance he's wearing a Cristiano Ronaldo shirt, by the way. <laughs> you see them coming out to water the street. What a great idea. In a city that's short of water, they're going to damp down the dust. You see them coming to, increasingly coming to look at antiquities. Um, this is, this is beautiful Tutankhamun's face. You see them in cafes, taking time to have a chat. You see them indulging in one, one of the great, uh, one of Egypt's great dishes, culinary gifts to the world, kushari, a mix of, of rice and pasta and lentils and toma spicy tomato sauce. You see them shoving their hands in the blood of a slaughtered animal and s slapping it on a house or a car or whatever to wish luck. And you see them just in love with this place. And how could it be otherwise when she is the mother of the world? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, it, I think we have a few minutes if anybody has any questions. I might not be able to answer them. Or else we could just proceed straight to the bar. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, I wish I could. Could I play you some Um Kalsum? No, but Sylvie can sing you some. <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't arrive for some reason. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, next time. Come back next week. We'll do it again. So do, do people sit in cafes and talk about politics, or is it? Well, what do you think? <laughs> do we? <laughs> yes, they talk about politics. And politics are getting really interesting now, because um, um, there's, been a, there's always been an issue of, uh, of pro proper dialogue um, and proper representation. And um, Mohammed El Baradai, the UN Atomic Energy um, Supremo has returned to Egypt and is asking questions which, which are really challenging people in, in Egypt. It's very interesting. I, nobody knows what's going to happen. There will be a presidential election uh, next year. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, 
But yes, they talk about politics all the time. And, uh, and like us, they're not always respectful to their politicians. Any more? Yeah. <clears throat> I notice we don't see many women in your pictures. Uh, where are the women? Are they still in, locked up or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they, 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 they do allow the manufacture of shoes now. <laughs> Uh, in fact, there's a real fetish of shoes. So downtown Cairo is one big shoe shop. It's extraordinary. Um, yeah, women, women are about, out and about. I mean, it's, it's very interesting what's happened to the position of women in the last, uh, well, it, in the time that I've been, been in Egypt, because suddenly you find, you find many, many more peop women going out to work. Um, and there are consequences to that. Um, one of them is in order to preserve their modesty, either because their family or they themselves feel they need to, or because they, they risk being hassled at work by men, um, more and more women are co covering up, um, at least wearing a headscarf as a sign of, you know, respect me. I'm, I'm a respectable person. Um, but w women are increasingly seen and heard, women in government, women, women in all, all forms of, of industry. Yeah. Um, what more, what more would you like to know about women in Egypt? No, there's... Uh, I mean, you know, we, I, th I think we have a mis misconception about, uh, about women in, in the Arab world, women in Islam. Um, we tend to think of them as being sort of bundled up and stuck at home. And, and there is another way of looking at it, and you could ask why, why do men feel the need to spend so much time in cafes? And I, a lot of men I know spend time in cafes because they don't feel in a way terribly welcome at home because it's not their domain, it's the domain of the woman. Um, there are two sides to everything. But it, Egypt, Cairo is changing so rapidly. It's, it's difficult to make any generalization at all about it at the moment, actually. I mean, as here. <clears throat> no, I, I don't. Um, because that slice of history was a bit, I said, doesn't, doesn't excite me terribly. The, the Greco-Roman part of Cairo, Babylon, old Cairo, would you like to, would you like to know about that? I, we just didn't have time to talk about everything, that's all. Um, cops in Cairo, um, well, how do you find out if someone's a cop? Do you go like that? And inevitably, they'll show you their tattoo on, written on, on their, their cross tattooed on their palm, I mean, on their, over their vein. Um, the, state, the plight of Copts at the moment, I, has it gone any worse? I don't know. Do you know about it? Oh, well, I'm sure you know a lot about it then. <clears throat> Hence your disappointment. Well, I'm sorry not to have, not to <laughs> not to have said more. Um, but I'll tell you a story about uh, Ragab Mofta. One of, the great, uh, one of the great pillars of the Coptic community for all of the, well, most of the hundred years that he lived for. Um, mu musicologist, in the 1920s, he reckoned that, uh, that the Coptic liturgy and the co music, Coptic music was in danger of being um, watered down, it was being influenced by, particularly by Brits, but by Europeans um, meddling in it. And so he started a sort of rearguard action to purify it and to then, well, it, he then went on after 20, 30, 40 years um, to try to identify the pure, the original sound. He was working on the Coptic liturgy and on the way it was sung and he was finding um, blind cantors because he said they, were the, they had the best memories but also the purest view on, on what this was and he was stripping away even, he reckoned, the Byzantine influences and getting that down to what was the original Coptic sound, which he then said was actually the sound of ancient Egypt, of the pharaohs, because he says, Copts, we just borrowed what was there in, in terms of a lot of, a lot of the, um, the, the rituals of religion, and certainly in the, way that, in the way that things were sung. So he reckoned he touched, after 75, 80 years of work, on the sound, the sound of the pharaohs, which, are, which I thought was really exciting. But... Um, there was, he was part of a Coptic revival, which included reviving Coptic iconography, Coptic churches, Cop 
But I can't say that, um, that I think life is very easy in Cairo for Copts. I think it's probably quite difficult. Um, whenever you see a Coptic church, invariably these days you see a mosque next door with an even taller minaret and an even louder call to prayer. Um, it's a sign of, a, of the two communities being at loggerheads. Yeah. Any more questions? How do you marry the, um, the city of religion with the city of pleasure in these stressful times? Ooh. We all do that, don't we? One way or another. I mean, I think we all have, we all have those two sides in us, the spiritual side and the lusty, you know, sort of... <laughs> um, <laughs> How do, you, how do you marry these two things together? Well, as I said, we, we, do it all, we do it all the time. They coexist. I don't think they coexist very happily. They don't, they don't tend to coexist very happily in people either, but uh, they do in the community. I mean, they are there. And every now and again, um, you know, bars are shut down and people are carted off for, you know, for offenses to pub public decency, and then they come back because people are people, after all. And, uh, when, Fl when Flaubert was there, for instance, in, uh, all the dancing women of Cairo in the 1840s, 1832, had been banished. They'd all been sent down to a place called Esna. Um, but they were back after a couple of, you know, couple of years. They slowly drifted back into the city. So it's what people do. It's what we're made of. Is there a question over there? And there are sort of lots of teeming historical, beautiful cities, um, you know, Mumbai, Naples. Um, you love Cairo, but is Cairo really special? And if it is really special, what makes it really, really special? Because there might be lots of teeming historical cities that aren't very nice places. I mean, you seem to imply that there's a kind of magic to Cairo. Is this a personal view? Is there a magic to Cairo? And then also the idea of a city arriving to a sort of tipping point that you feel that maybe there. Well, let's they come yeah, there's to two points. I'll, mm. I'll, I'll answer the tipping point first. Everybody has always thought that Cairo was about to explode. Um, even Batuta did in the 1300s. He writes about how, you know, you can't, it just can't go on like this. Um, the British officials moving in in the, in the 1880s said, you know, it can't, it can't go on like this. But in a way, Cairo is, is a bit like um, Cairo traffic. It sort of is, it works as a, as, a, as a model, as a metaphor for the city itself. Um, Cairo traffic, as everybody knows, you don't have to go there, is, is mad and chaotic and, and frustrating and ridiculous. And yes, people try get ushered the wrong way down one-way streets by policemen. But um, somebody, uh, Cairo planners, um, did a survey and brought in all sorts of, of, uh, of international consultants to work out what to do with it. And, and in the end, they decided the best thing to do was to leave it alone. Because somehow, this human element again, and this is uh, my answer to your other part of the question, this human element makes it work. It shouldn't work, and yet it does. And that's, that's, if, that's, if there's anything that makes Cairo special, it's that. It's a woman like Faiza Hassan saying, being, you know, daring to say, my husband's died, my kids have left, and I'm having a ball. It, it's, you know, it's people's, it's people's um, having a great sense of humor, apart from anything else. I mean, they need it, Lord knows, because, you know, laugh adversity in the face. But, uh, but there's, there's that human, human touch. Um, and I haven't found it anywhere else in the world. I, we, used to, we used to buy meat from one particular butcher when we lived there. And I hadn't seen him for about three or four years. And I was driving by, he was standing outside his shop and I was driving by in a taxi. And he saw me in the window and he came running after, waving at me. It, it, you know, I've been buying vegetables 25 years from the same people in the market in London. They still don't say hello to me. Um, you know, there's that human touch, that sense of, sense of shared humanity, that sense of, you know, of being, you know, of, of Sharing a really difficult life together is what makes is part of what makes Cairo so unique. Yes, I discovered a paradox recently. Cairo seems to attract millions, well, at least thousands of students from all over the Africa and, and the region, even though it's probably the poorest uh, economy uh, uh, around. How do you explain that? Uh, there's a history, of course. Um, 
Why are there so many? So why are there so many students? Why is such an aura about you know education and, and the prestige it seems to enjoy? Well, well, it's also the prestige of, of Al Azhar University. I mean, it's you know it, it, there there is nothing else like it in in Islam. If you want, if you want to study um, the Sunni law, then Al Azhar is the you know it's, it is the Oxford, the Cambridge of 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 Islam. Why would you not go there? Why would you go somewhere else? Um, it, it just, you know, it's after, th more, after a thousand years or so, it, it has a standing. Um, but it, it's also that it is still a meeting place. It is still a, a crossing, crossing place, as I described right at the very beginning. Um, Cairo doesn't produce anything. It still doesn't produce anything. I mean, it, there's no, you know, there's no, there's nothing that we buy that's imported from Cairo. We, Cairo is there because, because it's, it's a centerpiece. It's a linchpin. And, in the region. It's, it's geographically and historically bound. As I said, it's, that's why you go there. You go there because it's important, simply. Hi, I'm just two things. One, just a statement, which is, I've been to Cairo three times now, and the first time I went, it was I was going for work, and I didn't really have any desire. I thought, oh, it would be neat, neat to see the pyramids. But, and I fell in love with it after two days. I can't explain. So for the other person who was asking, you love it or you hate it. It's just something. And you just fall in love with it. Um, what I wanted to ask, you mentioned the Jacobian building. In the Jacobian building, they talk about the settlements on top of the roofs mm. where people who don't have so much money live. Do you know much about that? Or? Yeah, it started out. Um well, those beautiful 19th century and early 20th century, those sort of white, grand, Italian buildings that I showed you, every one of those, and, and, and by extension, every apartment building in, in Cairo has, and every building in Cairo has a, has a guardian, a bawab, doorman. Um, and part of, the, part of his perk, because very often they, these were people who weren't from Cairo, they came, a lot of them came from the south from, and from Nubia, um, was that they got free accommodation up on the roof. Um, and uh, their families grow, so you get another little bit of the roof. But also, it's a city that's growing up as well as sideways. I mean, it's, it grows hugely sideways. I, I, I see it every time I fly in. There's another patch of desert that's been covered. Um, but it's going up, and those spaces on the roof... Um, I mean, effectively, we were living in... We, we lived in, in Zamanek, which was a very smart part of town. But the bit we were living in on the top of this apartment block was an add-on. It was probably at some point had been a Bawabs and then it was extended and done up and, and then we came. So, um, and, you know, and the Yakubian building, I mean, uh, the, um, I know buildings like that downtown. And um, increasingly, the people who, are, who have the space on the top are going to be selling it on to someone else and moving further out, make some, make some key money, effectively. That's, I think that's one of the stories in the book, actually, isn't it? Yeah. It's been a bit you of um, are very persuasive about the fascination and interest of, of the city, as well as the difficulties of living there. What about the underbelly? I realize it's almost a vulgar question, having had such a good tour around the city, but what about the political underbelly? It's an authoritarian system. To what extent is there freedom of speech, and what about political prisoners? Ooh, okay. <laughs> uh, best till last. Um, freedom of speech, yes, there is freedom of speech, in that uh, you sit down with this man, and he's going to tell you exactly what he thinks. Um, freedom of speech, uh, you get up and write something in a newspaper uh, attacking the president, no, that's not going to work. Um, newspapers have licenses and they'll probably be revoked if they wrote something that was particularly offensive. Um, so in that sense, no. Um, Amnesty International report on Cairo is not pretty reading, but, um, and I, I wouldn't want to apologize in any way for that. I think um, human rights are an issue that need to be addressed. Um, there's a fundamental problem with politics in Egypt, um, and, and I think that's my last point. And it's one of education. I mean, you can give everybody the vote. We, we God knows we're trying hard enough in Iraq but, and, and Afghanistan, but what does it mean? I mean, people don't understand the intricacies of, of I mean, we're all gonna vote tomorrow. I mean, who, you know, 
who knows, who knows actually what we're going to be voting for. Um, so I, you know, the education is a key point in, in developing politics in, in Cairo. But I think Cairo is changing. I think, it, I think there is, and I think the internet has a large part to play in that and, and all sorts of other influences. But it's an international city. It's not able to lock itself up in the way that other, can, other cities can. And it is, it is changing. But it still has a long way to go. Anyway, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I'm going. Keep it going.